Welcome. Thank you for joining us for Ash Wednesday service. This service is uh, a reminder that our lives are put before our Lord and that uh, we can come to Him with everything wherever we are and know that uh, uh, this God has loved us, has crossed every uh, boundary, every gap, and desire to extend grace and mercy to us exactly where we are. And so we come to this service uh, in humility and in uh, expectation that uh, the God who has welcomed us will be faithful, will work in our lives, and indeed um, will speak to us in precisely the situations we find ourselves in. Let us uh, worship, pray, meditate, and uh, give ourselves over to our Lord this evening. May stand with us. Heavenly Father, we come back into this sanctuary on this day right in the middle of our lives. And Lord, it's our hope that your grace and your will for us would meet us precisely in the middle of our lives, in the middle of our weeks and our days, that Heavenly Father, our attention to you would be the focus of each and every day not just something we wait for, but something we encounter and take part in each and every day. And Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening in hope and expectation that this period of time, this Lenten season, will be an opportunity for us to direct our hearts and our minds to you with a deeper sincerity, with, a, with, with an expectation that you are the God who meets us precisely where we are, and that, Lord, through this time and this season, that we will find ourselves, indeed, drawing closer to you and ready all the more for Easter. Thank you again, Lord, for the model set before us in Jesus Christ, a model that showed us that entering into a time, a season of, of fasting, of prayer, can indeed draw us closer to you. And so, Lord, we come to you th this evening. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, today we're going to hear uh, Isaiah 58, 1 through 12 from Fred. You can be seated. Isaiah 58, 1 through 12. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion 
and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways, as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they ask, if, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? And on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes. Is that what you call fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the change of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? when you see the naked, to clothe him, and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. <clears throat> If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls and restorer of streets with dwellings. The word of the Lord. You can stand together if you wish.
Amen. Please be seated. I want to share with you from Psalm 51. The words of the psalm uh, will be on the screen, but some words that do show up in the scriptures, um, usually from uh, editor's notes that remind us kind of the place of the psalm. Psalm 51 says that this is to the leader of, of it would be to the leader of the assembly, the one who is singing and guiding the temple and singing. It says, it's a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So Psalm 51, verse 1 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being, therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. And then I'll teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. And deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation. And my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips. My mouth will declare your praise, for you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings, whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is a psalm written when David hears from the prophet Nathan who comes with him and comes with him with a little bit of a story. You might remember this story. He doesn't know how to approach the king about this, and so he tells the king a story, and he says, you know, there was a landowner who had plenty of livestock, and yet, and there was another person who did not have any livestock, uh, livestock other than this one lamb that it just loved and it adored. And Nathan tells the story. He says, imagine that the one with all this livestock has come and takes that one lamb from the other one who had nothing else. What would you think? And David says, this is terrible. How, how horrible is this? That landowner should be punished. That land over should be punished for this absolute wrong that they have done. And Nathan looks, him, looks at him and says, you are that man. David, who has taken the wife of a military leader named Uriah and then uh, put Uriah in the front lines to make sure that she would be widowed so that he could have her as his own. He has been confronted with that sin, and the prophet warns him that he's going, to be, he's going to suffer the consequences of this, that God is going to enact consequences, that his children are going to be filled with strife, and that his kingdom is not going to be without difficulty, that all of this is going to be laid upon him. And he writes this psalm recognizing how absolutely uh, in the wrong he was. And so when you hear about this cry out to God, Purify me, cleanse me, blot out my transgressions. He has certain transgressions in mind. And he's hoping indeed that this one transgression will not follow him for all of his life. But interestingly enough, it is one that uh, he is well known for. He is confronted with his sin and he realizes that his life is short of the desire God has had for him. And that uh, in this psalm, he wants to now yield his life life back to God. And so he writes, according to your mercy, blot out my transgressions, cleanse me from sin. 
And this is, in this psalm, this is a reflection of this is the nature of God, that God doesn't want to hold those past transgressions against us. God wants, indeed, out of His abundant mercy, to do just that in our lives, to blot out transgressions, to cleanse from sin. This, I mean, that is a part of what we, we testify happens on the cross when Jesus Christ goes to the cross and dies. That the cross is a symbol that all of our sins, all of our transgressions have been redeemed by Jesus. Our relationship with God can be restored. Our relationship with others can be restored. That there is nothing so far gone that God won't extend mercy and grace to us. That the promise of God's providence and eternal care is indeed shown and covered by Jesus and His commitment to the cross. And so on this day, we'll be receiving the sign of the cross. A sign remembering that all of our sins, all of our mess, all of that is redeemed by our God. It's why we'll wear the sign of the cross. We will wear the mark of God's abundant mercy revealed in Jesus Christ. That God's desire is for a renewal of our relationship. And on this day, we proclaim that we have been marked by His mercy despite any failings on our part. Uh, David will end up saying, my sin is ever before me. And he'll end up using some strange words. He'll say, against you and you alone have I sinned. Well, David knows he sinned against Bathsheba and against Uriah, but yet this is poetic hyperbole as a part of this song, when he says, against you and you alone have I sinned. He's not, it's not ignoring what he's done to that couple, but recognizing that his sin does not just have earthly ramifications, but also is a transgression against the very God who brings life. All of our actions, all of our inactions, all of our wrongs, all of our transgressions, all of our debts against one another, are in fact debts against our Lord. No wonder we pray every Sunday, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It is a way of us to recognize that uh, our, our sins of this world aren't just our own or against another. They're against God. Last spring, on Palm Sunday, we had the palm branches and we waved them, just as those who had uh, welcomed Jesus into Jerusalem nearly 2,000 years ago waved branches and laid them out before Him. We had branches with us in worship. But afterwards, we did something we hadn't done before, something that pastors in preparation for this day usually just did all by themselves, but we did it as a church last year. We took those burnt, or we took those palm branches and we took them outside and, and we burned them. We burned them as a sign. We burned them on the one hand as a sign of releasing our praise to God, that just as the palm branches recognizes the praise of, of Jesus coming into Jerusalem as King, that uh, we too want to lift up our praise to God, but we also burned them recognizing that in the course of a year, since that last spring, our praise might wither. It might turn sour. Oftentimes our promises, our commitments become distracted by the ways of this world and by the temptations against us. Much like the crowd that waved Jesus into the city one day then rejected Him just a few days later, crying out, crucify Him. So often our life is not always marked with unblemished loyalty. The burning of those palm leaves was a reminder of that condition. And so today, we'll receive the sign of the cross with the very ashes burned last Palm Sunday here at this church. It is a sign that those transgressions, those sins, those debts are indeed forgiven and redeemed by Jesus on the cross. The abundant mercy of God does indeed forgive 
And we receive the sign of the cross in hope and trust of that forgiveness. And this forgiveness is transformative as well. Our lives can be marked with a further commitment. A commitment to follow after Jesus, indeed to take up the cross and follow Him wherever it leads. Even if it leads to our own return to ashes. Nonetheless, we trust in the grace of God to transform us to this kind of faithfulness, to follow Jesus, to take up the sign of the cross, or to literally take up the cross as Simon of Cyrene did that we talked about last Sunday. So the psalmist prays in expectation of this transformation. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. This isn't just a prayer of uh, maybe this will happen, but he actually believes that God can transform him. In fact, David will also come to be known as a man after God's own heart. Indeed, that transformation begins to take place. And so this service will indeed remind us in some ways of those failures or faults, but also of God's grace. But with ashes, also this service reminds us of our own mortality. The ashes are a symbol of the world before God's Spirit breathed life into it. According to Genesis, God's Spirit, or God breathed into or inspirited the dust of the earth and formed humanity, Adam and Eve. But ashes are also a symbol of death. Ashes mark destruction and the end of life as well as symbolized by the ashes of the palms, as experienced by any who have cremated a loved one, as experienced by those in war-torn territories. Ashes remind us that our lives and our breath are always yielded back to the one who has given it. So we yield our lives over and even this gift of breath back to the Lord that we can cry out with David. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God will not despise that. So let us come forward today with a broken spirit. We'll be trusting in God who raises the dead, who invites us to carry the cross and faithfulness and is still transforming lives out of His abundant mercy. Today we begin a spiritual journey that will span 40 days from Ash Wednesday until Saturday just before Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. In the early days of the church, this season of Lent was a time of preparation where new converts would ready their hearts to enter into Christian baptism on Easter Sunday. Since these new members were often received into the church, into the living community of faith, the entire community was called in preparation. So everyone joined in this being a time of repentance, this being a time of putting ourselves before the Lord. This was a time when those who had been separated from the church because of explicit sin could also prepare to rejoin the church. And so the season of Lent is a time of prayer, of fasting, of self-examination, and penitence for all Christians as we prepare to celebrate Easter. Through this season... We are reminded that we are totally unworthy before a holy God, that we have nothing with which we can obtain salvation on our own, that our best efforts at righteousness often fall far short. This season reminds us how much we need grace in our lives in order to live a transformed life that reflects God's love. We're called to renew our commitments and our faith as we continually acknowledge our need of God's transforming presence with us. So I invite you to observe Holy Lent, not just on this day, but throughout this season, through self-examination, through repentance, through prayer, through fasting and self-denial. This is often a season where someone will uh, deny themselves or fast from something during the course of this time until Easter Sunday, and to read and meditate on God's Holy Word. Uh, I've also known people to say that uh, this season, maybe instead of fasting from something, they will commit themselves to a new healthy practice. That instead of abstaining from something, they will commit to something new, which is its own kind of sacrifice of time or resources. 
and in some ways is a reflection of Isaiah 58, which was read for us earlier as well. That God desires things like righteousness and care for those around us. But to make a right beginning of repentance and as a mark of our mortal nature, let us now invite God to examine our hearts as we wait silently before Him. As we get ready to uh, receive the ashes, there is a, a responsive reading. It's number 342 in your hymnal. And is, uh, you can turn to that if you'd like, or the words are up here. I will read the... Uh, part that follows the L, if you would read the words in bold afterwards. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity, cleanse me from sin. Cleanse me with your and I will be clean. Wash me. Create in me a pure heart, O God. And renew the spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence. Or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. We have now joined our words with the words of David, and we have now, uh, and now we will join in this practice of the early church and the contemporary church of reminding ourselves that uh, these ashes are a sign for us of our mortality, but also of God's grace. Let's pray together. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality and our penitence, that we may remember that it is only by your gracious gift that we are given everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Um, I'm going to invite you to come forward now uh, in a spirit of penitence and receive on your head in ashes the sign of the cross. It is the symbol of our mortality. It is the symbol of the cost of sin. And yet it is also the sign of our salvation and promise of eternal life. When you receive, uh, when you come forward, we'll have you come forward from this side again. And when you receive it, feel free to uh, take a moment to pray. Uh, in our church, sometimes uh, the, the place of prayer is right along this, these altar rails here on the sides. If you would like to kneel in prayer after receiving the ashes for a time, feel free to do so. If you'd rather go back to your seat, that is okay as well. If for some reason you can't uh, receive the uh, ashes on your forehead, when you come forward, just hold out uh, your hand like this, and I'll place the sign of the cross on your right hand. But I invite you at this time to come forward and receive. <coughs>
um, I think last year I, I, I had a moment where I was like, I don't know what to do. Uh, last time I did the Ash Wednesday service, I had been in South Portland, I had another pastor do it for me. But it feels weird to do it myself. Um, um, would someone be willing to put the, the sign of the cross on my head for me this morning? <laughs> Anyone? Tim? Come on forward. Thanks. Um, just put a little oil on your hand, reach in the bowl, and then just do the sign of the cross on my forehead. Indeed. Thank you. Appreciate it. If you need this, here you go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, just, I just feel like it is, um, it is good to be reminded and have someone else um, uh, put the cross on me. So um, let us sing together, indeed, what I hope are words that will reflect to our attitude today. Have thine own way. That, that would be our prayer that his will would be done in our, in our life. Let's sing this song together. I still remember the first time that uh, I received the sign of the cross. I did not grow up uh, in a church that uh, did Ash Wednesday very often. And uh, I remember looking in a mirror afterwards and going, hmm, why, why did I do that? That was kind of weird. <laughs> um, but yet, sometimes there are practices within the church that remind us our faith is more than just a an inner kind of feeling that we have. There are outward practices that go with it. As we read in Isaiah 58, when Fred read for us today, uh, that uh, our, our, our spirit, our, our uh, relationship with God is indeed exercised out in our world. And so today, when you look in the mirror, when you, when you see that cross, or if you forget and someone reminds you out there that, uh, <laughs> hey, what is that? Uh, remember that it is uh, an example of us saying we are going to live out this faith. And this season is, is a season of specifically saying 
I'm going to put God first. And if I need to put something on the back burner until Easter, I'm going to do that as a reminder that He will be first in my life. Go in peace. Remember that you are but ashes and dust. Would be unworthy of being called the people of God, but also remember that where there had been no people, God out of His love and grace has made a people, children of His own. Let us go forth in the humility to be Christ's disciples and God's children. Amen.